Alrighty, guys, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and now verses 14 through 18. And the last couple of weeks, we looked at Ephesians chapter 2, we began to see that Satan was the god of this world, and the children of disobedience, which is all of us, began to follow him. And that they were lost, we were filling the lust of our flesh and of our mind, and because of that, we weren't just children of disobedience, but become children of wrath. And the Apostle Paul includes all of us in that category. So this morning, we're going to look at how Jesus becomes our peace or mediator between God and mankind. And we know a lot of this, so we got to be careful. A lot of the church, you know, people, not, not just when I say church, people get offended right away, you know. Oh, me too? Well... I'm talking about not just the, the non-denominational, but the denominational churches. Um, a lot of the times, and not all, right? It depends on the pastor, depends on the people, can become very self-righteous, and we begin to believe that we're better than other people. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all. In the history of beliefs and religion, there's many opinions Many beliefs in Hinduism, right? Mormonism, Islam, even Christianity, and all religion is man trying to get up to heaven, pulling himself up through works, through sacrifice, through a system, trying to get there, but he can't. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, we begin to see that God himself, through Jesus Christ, makes a way to heaven. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 18, let me read it for you guys. For he himself is our peace, who has both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law, the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man, from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So the enmity, or this wall of separation, has been between man and God since the beginning of time. You remember that in Ephesians, or actually Genesis chapter 2, and verse 8, very important. In the very beginning, something happened that separated mankind from God. And it's been that way ever since. So, if you look at all religions, if you look at all systems, it's man trying to make peace with God. Man trying to get to heaven with God. And that's where all these different religions come into play and they are different. They're not the same. But here we're looking at biblical Christianity. What does the Bible say? What does the apostle here, Paul, say about this wall of separation between God and man? How do I get to heaven? How do I get there when I die? And here he says that Jesus has broken down some kind of wall that separated us from God. That Jesus has abolished the enmity between God and man. And he says through the cross. Very important stuff. But if we go all the way back, some say perhaps 6,000 years from our time, maybe longer, we're not sure. If we go all the way back to the beginning, the first man and the first woman, we see that God planted a garden somewhere there in the Fertile Crescent, there in the Middle East. We know that it names the Euphrates River and the Tigris River here in Scripture. So somewhere there in the Middle East, God made a garden. And we read, the Lord God planted the garden eastward in Eden. And there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here the Lord gives just one command. And it wasn't to be restrictive. 
It wasn't to be oppressive to mankind. It was to protect mankind from dying. Now, some of you may ask, well, why would God even put or allow something poisonous to be among mankind? Well, he made us with something called free will. We're not robots. We have something called free will, and we got to choose to obey God or disobey God. we got to choose to love him or not to love him. And here we read, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden, to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you do eat it, you shall surely die. Interesting. Adam, this tree, out of all the trees here, is poisonous. And you can't eat it because the day that you do, you're going to die. We know what happens here in Genesis chapter 3, the next chapter over. There was an animal possessed by the devil who comes and he tricks or deceives man and gets them to disobey the word of God. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So here we see, number one, that the serpent doesn't come to the man, but he comes to that which is closest to the man, in this case, the woman, his wife. And he begins to talk to her, and now he begins to quote the word of God out of context. Has God indeed said? Now causing question to the word of God. And then he quotes it, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He misinterprets it now. Instead of saying just this one, he says out of all of them. And now the woman messes up by talking to Satan. She needs to rebuke him. She needs to not talk to him. She needs to not entertain him, entertain him and get rid of him. But she goes on and, and dialogues with him. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the tree. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And now here Eve adds to the word of God. She says, not just eat it or touch it, lest you die. But she's on the right track. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So now he blatantly lies and twists the word of God. God said, if you touch it, you're going to die. Satan says, don't listen to God. If you touch it, you're not going to die. If God says something is wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't matter who tells you different. God said it's wrong. It's wrong. He doesn't change. Now Satan goes on to speak for God. For God knows that in every, that, that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he tells her blatantly, you're not going to die. Actually, He's keeping a secret from you. You're going to be enlightened. And now you're going to be like God. Well, you'll know good from evil. You're not going to die. You'll just know good and evil. Was Satan speaking truth? No. <laughs> he was twisting the truth. And making poison and making death look actually tempting. They will... No good from evil, as you're going to see. But they will also die. So the woman, when she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. So he had her. He was able to dialogue with her. He was able to tempt her. And now physically she began to lust and crave it with her eyes as she saw that it was good for food. She needed it. She wanted it. She had to have it. And then internally, the desire to be wise or enlightened spiritually was there. So here it says, and the tree desirable to make one wise. 
And that's where religion comes in. All religions are false or man-made or inspired by Satan himself. All of them. People say, I am spiritual. That's great. But the desire to be enlightened, the desire to know more about things of God absent from the scriptures is not good. It is poison. So she desired um, to make one wife. She took of the fruit, ate it. She also gave it to her husband and he ate it. In this case, maybe Adam was ready for Satan, guarded against his attacks. Maybe that sneaky serpent, I'm not going to talk to him, I'm going to kill him when I see him. But Satan was smart. He didn't come as a snake. He came through Adam's wife, Eve. And she was able to get Adam to eat of this fruit or disobey the word of God. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves covering. Very interesting. You don't have to underline it, but maybe mentally underline they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. What did, an, what did Adam and Eve just do? They disobeyed the word of God. What do we call that? It starts with an S. Sin. sin. They sinned. Now what do they do afterwards? They covered themselves or they covered their sin. But the Bible says them Sounds with what? Fig leaves. They covered their private parts. They were naked now. And they themselves covered for their sin. In a sense, this would be equivalent to the first man-made religion. For all religion is an attempt to cover or atone for your bad deeds or for your sins. And if you do enough good ones or you cover it, you get into heaven, most religions teach. So here they made themselves a covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. In the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife had hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they felt guilty. Now they're scared of God when before they were happy to see him like children running to him. Then the Lord God called to Adam and he said to him, Where are you? Now I think we don't have the tone here, but in context of all of Scripture, I don't think God has his arms crossed and is angry all the time, ready to judge and smite you. But those of us who have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren know the love of a parent towards a child. And when a child does something wrong, and you know they're guilty and they're hiding, you're not like, where are you? Right? It's more out of, come here. Where are you spiritually? What's going on in your life that you're doing these things? It's out of love and compassion and correction. I think here God had a broken heart and not out of anger or ready to judge like he gets joy off of hurting his own children or disciplining them. I think like a loving father, he says, where are you? Where are you? He knows the consequences. So Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? So here it's like you catch a kid, a two, three, four year old, they're not that bright. They steal a cookie from the cookie jar and, and you told them, don't take the cookie. And you come in the kitchen and, and right away they're guilty and they're hiding it and behind their back. And it's not that God is dumb, it's he's trying to get Adam, I believe, to just confess as a parent tries to get their little one to tell the truth. I know you did wrong, I know you disobeyed my word, I know the cook is behind your back. And you begin to ask him questions to give him opportunity to speak the truth to you. And here the Lord says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? 
then the man does something that most men do. No, instead of taking responsibility and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up, I shouldn't have done this, he blames the woman. He blames the woman. That's what he does. Poor Eve, she's probably like, just go forward, Adam. And instead of Adam manning up and saying, all right, Lord, I did it, I'm sorry, it won't happen again, please forgive me, he steps back and he says literally, <laughs> It's the woman that you gave me. He blames the woman and he blames God. The woman whom you gave me to be with, she gave me of the tree and I ate. I was good, Lord, until she showed up. I was fine. She is the one who gave it to me and, and you gave her to me, so it's your fault. And God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman doesn't fess up either. She says, the devil made me do it. Notice, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, so now he's going to curse the serpent. He's going to curse the woman. And he's going to curse the man. Have you, have you ever wondered why this world is so messed up if God is the God of this world or created it? Well, here it is. It's a fallen world because of what? Disobedience and sin. The Garden of Eden was a paradise on earth. Was, was man with God and fellowship with God. No wall of separation. But now because of sin. Now because of the curse. Man will now be separated from the presence of God. And he is cursed. And creation is cursed. The animals are cursed. They eat each other now. It's horrible what they do to each other. They bite the neck and break bones and eat each other. They didn't do that before, but now they will because of this curse. Mankind will kill each other, will hurt each other, will rip each other off. Why? Why are they so evil? Because of sin, because of this curse. Notice, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now the Lord prophesies, He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. Speaking of how the Lord will crush Satan's head, but Satan will bruise his heel through the crucifixion. Now to the woman, God says, so before birth must have been painless or very little pain. But notice he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In your pain you shall bring forth children. And notice, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. So birth pain comes from this curse, but also the woman wanting to rule the home or be above her husband and, and, and not be submissive to him also comes from this curse. Then to Adam he said, now he curses the man because you have heeded the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. So now the whole world, the whole earth becomes cursed. Before there were no thorns or thistles. Interesting. Now there would be before the earth was probably even more fertile to um, grow, and now man would have to work harder at it. And the sign of the curse is what? Thorns and thistles, right? Interesting that when Jesus was being crucified, he had a crown of thorns upon his brow, breaking that curse. Notice, in toil, and in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Now here, not just a cursed world or sin, but now death enters the world and mankind. Notice, till you return to the ground. Now you're going to die, Adam. Before you weren't going to die. <laughs> now you will. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. 
Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Underline that mentally or underline that in your Bible. We saw how earlier they made coverings for themselves. Now God himself covers them with what? Tunics of skins. Where did the skin come from? Animals. Animals have skin. Good boy, Nico. Animals. What had to happen to the animals for God to get the skin? Yeah. He had to kill them. He had to sacrifice them. And now we see how blood would have to be shed to cover the sins of man. And God, a little bit later from this time, would institute a religion called Judaism that would come sometime later that was God-ordained and what the priest would do is sacrifice lambs, doves, bulls, animals, would shed the blood of animals to atone or cover temporarily the sins of God's people. Now, all this blood and sacrifice would eventually point to a future sacrifice that we'll get into in a little bit. Notice, then God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to, to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed a cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So two trees, guys. One was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Man ate it. He's poisoned now. The next tree would be the tree of life. And the Lord is saying, if he eats this, he's going to be in this condition forever. So the Lord, out of mercy and love and compassion, separates man from his presence. And now because of sin also, man is separated from God's presence. And they're kicked out of this Garden of Eden. But very interesting, the Lord places a cherubim angel there to guard the entrance back into the presence of God with a flaming sword. And man is kicked out. Well, if we fast forward a couple thousand years, actually some, some 4,000 years later, perhaps, we're not sure exactly, but let's fast forward from the, from the first man, however long it was ago, up all the way to the time of Jesus, did you know that in the temple there in Jerusalem, it was basically a rectangular building with two compartments, very crudely saying, right? I know I'm butchering it. But two compartments. The, the bigger compartment was called the holy place. And that holy place was separated by a 18 inch thick wall made or curtain that looked like a wall that separated the holy of holy places where the presence of God would dwell. Now on this huge curtain, there was a cherubim angel with a flaming sword, symbolizing the exact picture that we just read when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and now symbolizing that man is separated from God because of what? Sin. No one was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest once a year. Now to our text in Ephesians, it says that Jesus has broken down the middle wall of separation. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27 and now verse 45. I love this. I think we falsely believe that God loves judging 
non-believers or sinners, right? And I hate using the word sinners when Christians go, oh, the sinners. I remember going to a party um, after a funeral, and it's family, right? So, so our family, they, they drink socially, but they don't really get drunk. They, they handle it. It's just the culture. And everyone's, you know, bringing kegs and beer. And, and there was um, a sergeant from another family, um, but he was like Pentecostal Christian. And, and I wasn't drinking, but I remember he pointed out, oh, that's how we need to act among sinners. And my other family members looked at him like, really? Are you calling us sinners? And I'm thinking, that's horrible. Don't call them sinners. Just because they're drinking doesn't mean they're not like drunk or they're not rowdy. They're just drinking. In some cultures, that's what happens. But I remember I cringed at those words, sinners. And now looking at having a child who is lost, because I do. I now, you know, and we know it biblically, but, but I, I see it from a different perspective. God loves all His children, and we're all His children, both saved and lost. And we're all sinners. We've just been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. But the Bible says that God will leave the 99 to go after the one who is lost. The Bible also says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God... The Bible also says, waits to judge the world because he's not willing that any should perish. So he doesn't get pleasure out of judging mankind and, and, and he doesn't send them to hell. He did everything possible, even sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to save all his children so they can go to heaven. He gets no pleasure in judging the wicked. There's many scriptures that the Bible says. His heart breaks for the lost. And as the church, we shouldn't be like, sinner, sinner, sinner. I understand there's certain movements we don't like in the leadership, but individuals, they're lost. And we need to love them and pray for them and love on them and, and, and just that love that will lead them to repentance. The self-righteous church, when I was a young man and I was rebellious and I was crazy and I was flicking off cops and just crazy, that drove me more away from the Lord. But it's that unconditional love, not enablement, right? But that unconditional love that, that led me to repentance. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, we read, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. So now we're talking about the crucifixion. And we just saw that movie Arisen, which was really good. So we kind of have a good mental picture of how it was. Well, darkness was over the land and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachameth, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we'll never know what our Lord Jesus went through. In the garden he prayed, Lord, if it is thy will, let this cup pass over me. And he sweated drops of blood. He was so stressed out. I don't think he was so much stressed out over the physical pain that he would endure. But he was about to be punished for all the past, present, and future sins of every single person who has lived and will live on earth. And he was going to receive punishment for all of that and be separated from the Father. Notice, some of those who stood there when they heard that, they said, this man is calling for the prophet Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a ring and offered it for him to drink. The rest said, let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again, saying with a loud voice, and yielded his spirit. What did he say, guys? What was the last words Jesus said? It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. It is finished. And before I, I explain what he meant, let me tell you what the Bible says happened to that curtain in the temple of God. That curtain with a cherubim angel and the fiery sword representing separation from God. Now that Jesus died and paid for the sins of mankind on the cross, and he says it is finished, 
Notice in verse 51, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Interesting. The Lord says, it is finished. Then God goes to the temple and that curtain that represents separation between man and God is ripped from top to bottom. And the Lord says, it is finished. It is finished or it is accomplished. The payment for sin has been paid. Our Lord has broken down that middle wall of separation through His blood on the cross. Now we can come boldly into the presence of God because of what Jesus Christ has done. No longer separated because of sin. Jesus paid for the sin on the cross. Now through Jesus Christ we can say, Lord, please forgive us of our sins. The Bible says our sins are washed and we're given eternal life. And now we have access to God. We don't need to go through a religion, any religion, not even Christianity. We go directly through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one goes to the Father but through me. So now through Jesus Christ, now we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, we have immediately access to the Father. We're still sinners, but we're washed and we're cleansed by His blood. We are forgiven by God because of what His Son has done on the cross. And now we have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. And I ripped the notes I already read, so I'm good. <laughs> if we go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Our Lord says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Ephesians, he's talking about how he's also broke uh, or kept the ordinances, the law. The law was burdensome. Religion is burdensome. Those of you who are raised Catholic know what that, you know, and actually followed it, know what it is. Those of you who come from other religions know how burdensome religion is. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to keep these rules and laws. You have to eat these certain foods or abstain from those foods. You can't eat meat on Fridays or whatever the rules are. It's burdensome. It's taxing. But now through Jesus Christ... You don't follow any religion, not even Judaism. You come to Him directly, and when you do, He gives you rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now we can come to Jesus now we can pray directly to Him. Now instead of having to go to church or having to read our Bible or having to do things, we want to. We can't get enough because now it's in us and it's not just outside of us that it's something we should do. Now we want to do these things. So this morning, just an exhortation and remember that, you know what, we have direct access to God through the Son Jesus Christ Ephesians 14 through 18, the Apostle Paul saying how our Lord has broken down that middle wall of separation and now we have access directly to the Father. No longer are we separated, but now we are with Him. And He said, Lo, I am with you even till the end of this age. We're not alone, even though we may feel alone. We're not alone. He loves us. He's with us. Let's go ahead and stand and close in a word of prayer. Father, we just come before you, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for your word, Lord, in context. I pray, Lord, that you help us, Lord. Pray to you in the name of your Son.
And be conscious, Father, that you do love us and you do hear us and we do have access to you, Lord, because in that it changes everything. We love you so much and we worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.